Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Merrimack School Budget Committee meeting of January 29th. I would ask that you all please rise, and I would ask Jordan Guadalupe to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance to our country's flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you and welcome. Um, tonight, just so everybody knows, in case you do not have an agenda in front of you, um, we're going to be having a presentation by Matt uh, on the sheet that was handed out before we start reviewing the budgets so that we will have a complete understanding of what's going on. Now, I am going to make use this different machine to set up the conference calling with two people on it. And we have the expert here also in case it doesn't work. They've done some upgrades and hopefully it's going to work. So it's going to take a minute to get everybody online. Oops. Whoops. I'm not going to dial my number. That isn't going to do any good. Hi, Carol. It's Stanley. Uh, st you can hear me, right? Yep. Good. Stay right there. You might, you might hear elevator music or whatever. I got to get Mackenzie online, and then I'm, we'll be back. Okay, uh, no. Hi. Hi there, Mackenzie. It's Stan. Pretty good. We are going to. We should be all set. Can you hear me, Carol? Yep. Can you hear me, Mackenzie? Yes. Okay. I got to ask you both some questions for the record. Uh, Carol, where are you located tonight? And is there anybody with you? Just the cat ginger. Okay. Mackenzie, where are you located? Washington, D.C. Okay, and is there anybody with you? No. Okay. Uh, just so, because you haven't done this, Mackenzie, before, if you have a question to ask, just ask it, uh, you know, just tell me you have a question, and then we will get to you in line, and Carol already knows that. Now, what you did not hear first was the agenda, and because you're not here, you don't have a copy of it. Uh, we're going to have a presentation by Matt, and unfortunately, we just got the sheets, so I can't give you a sheet. It's going to talk about uh, different adjustments that have been made to the school budget uh, before we start uh, reviewing the budgets on the different departments. And then we'll get into the budget reviews for the departments. So all set with that? Stan, is this going to be anything different than what we discussed at our department review the other day? Uh, shouldn't be. Okay. All set with that, Mackenzie? Yes. Okay. At this time, I would ask Matt Chevronel to come forward and do the presentation he wanted to.
Oh, and before you get started, Matt, I'm sorry. Um, Shelley, David, uh, and Chuck are excused. Chuck may be here, but might not be here. But Shelley uh, flew out to Baltimore. David's unavailable. And Shelley, our resident Super Bowl fan, uh, is going to the Super Bowl this weekend with her daughter again. Lucky person. Okay, Matt, sorry about that. That's fine. Um, the sheet that I'm going to be referring to, if those of you uh, on the conference call have internet access, it was just posted on our homepage, sau26.org, and it's like one of the first items as you scroll down the page after the, uh, the big picture that uh, greets you when you see it. Basically, what I'm doing is I want to give you guys the updated budget because what you're looking at was uh, modified by the school board on January 22nd. So before you, you have a list of those modifications. You see the budget initially as presented to the board by administration was 78198819 uh, The board took some action that reduced it by 544000 and so the budget now is 77654036 So in essence, I'll go through these. The first item that was done was a cut to the athletic transportation for practices. The board felt that any practices that were in Merrimack that the kids didn't require transportation. If it was outside of Merrimack, like let's say they're going to Sauhegan Woods for golf or they're going to Westside Arena for hockey, those are practices, that's where they practice, and so we would provide transportation for that. But if they're going to the fields in Reeds Ferry, if they're going to Wasserman Park, if they're going other places in town, that we wouldn't provide transportation. Uh, the next area is, you know, year by year we've had roofing projects in the budget, and this year, um, it was prudent in order to get down below the default budget uh, to take the roof at MES and Master Cola Upper Elementary School out of the picture, delay it one year, and in talking with Tom, this is just him and I speaking, uh, the thought process that we would have is we have, because we've been vigilant in the past, we have enough leeway to shift out everything, the entire plan, one year. So that's a reduction of 655805 Then another item was the switch gear at Master Cola Upper Elementary School. We're re still replacing the switch gear that's here in the high school. I'm pointing because it's right over there. I'm sorry, just a reflex action. And uh, we've had... Um, an engineering review, we had a fire department review. The engineering review is, is ongoing. It's a lot more complicated than we first had thought it was. We had a meeting, Tom and I, at the uh, fire station with Chief Courier, the building inspector, uh, John Manuel, the uh, fire marshal, and the chief electrical inspector for the state of New Hampshire. And so he consulted with us on the replacement of that gear We've had problems with it tripping uh, repeatedly throughout the last few years. And we talked about this switch gear in the upper elementary school, it being of the same vintage. And he asked us the question, are you having any problems with it tripping? And we said, no, we're not. He says, well, I would really kind of, you know, advise you to, to perhaps not replace that until you start to get at least one issue, one incident or something like that. And when that does happen, we have a contractor in town, Custom Electric, I'm sure everybody's driven by their building a thousand times on uh, Route 3, 
who comes over and resets that switch gear for us until we can get that replaced this summer. So it wasn't prudent to do the switch gear at Master Cola Upper Elementary School. We're going to have to hire um, an engineer to size it because there's certain code, code issues you have to meet. You have to have 42 inches in the front of the switch gear to access it. Um, you have to have all these different dimensions and everything like that. And we're not sure of the size of the switch gear that we would need to replace the one at the upper elementary school. So we're going to hold off on that, <clears throat> do, some, do some homework on it, and come back around perhaps next year and feed that into the uh, operating budget for 2021. The next item has to deal with special ed. Uh, you know that climate and air quality for special ed is uh, very important. It is very important for a lot of the kids in those areas, and John can speak more about this than I, to have um, air that is of good quality and good um, uh, a coolness level. There are some kids with breathing difficulties. So this is something that was needed, so it was put back in the budget. The rest of the items I'm talking are, are items that were on the cut list that administration took out from the requests made by the principals and directors that the board looked at and chose to put back in. So this is a, a Nancy Rose one, but it resides in Tom's, Tom Tussauds budget, whiteboards district, district wide. Uh, for 15,000, uh, crack fill the playground areas at Reeds, the windows replacement at Reeds and Thornton's. Those windows, if you've been in those offices, are, are cracked and no longer hold their seals and they're really uh, very antiquated and are in very poor shape and they need to be, they need to be replaced. There's, there's no question about that. We could have put it off for another year but the board chose to put that back in the budget and get it done uh, this summer. There's also some wood posts right when you drive into Reeds Ferry School. Uh, when you drive into Reeds Ferry Elementary School, you're faced with a couple of dumpsters and the entrance is off to the right as opposed to your direct line of sight. You're actually looking at the back of the school. So in that area, before the fenced in playground where the kids have recess or when they get dropped off in the morning and the weather's okay, they can run around and have a great time out there. There's these wooden telephone poles that have been in there since I don't know how long, the 1970s. And when we redid the parking lot at Thornton's Ferry, not this past one, but years ago, because we redesigned the whole parent, the whole parent drop-off area, student drop-off area, they had those same poles there. And we removed them and put a nice guardrail. That's what we like to do there, because they're, they're old telephone poles, they have splinters on top. It's something that kids aren't going to be near because of the fence, but there's always the opportunity where you'd have a kid there and could catch a splinter or something like that. And just aesthetically and functionally, they, they just don't work anymore. So we decided to go ahead and replace those. There's some uh, aluminum tables for Muse and the high school. The Muse tables, basically, uh, they're lighter. They're easier for the custodial staff to move around. And they'll service well when the elections hit because that's when all the uh, tables have to be moved, have to be uh, reorganized on the floor and everything like that. So we put those back in. And then in the high school, the uh, student parking lots, um, that's uh, something to do the crack fill on there so they don't get any worse. So that was uh, a prudent addition to the, the budget. So, so net, you've got a certain sum coming out and then you have another sum coming in. So it adds up to a total reduction of $544,000, giving you a new bottom line, which is on your other sheet here that I passed out, a one point, you didn't pass that out, Pat? I didn't give it to you? My apologies.
you have one of these in your budget book already. I think it's in the, the back of the book. It's called the Budget and Revenue Summary for 2019-2020. And the 2019-2020 budget, when you look in the upper square, uh, it now says $77,654,036, which right now the budget that you have with these adjustments equals that amount. And it's an increase of $1,072,000, or in other words, a 1.4% increase. Used to be two point something, now it's 1.4 after the changes that the board made. So, in a nutshell, you know, we have a budget that's 1.4%. We have a budget that's, um, I wish I had my, my notes here, but I think it's $300,000 less than the default budget. And it's um, something that the board felt prudent to do. And that's it as far as the presentation of what the changes and modifications were, were made. So that's all the information I wanted to give you so you know what you're looking at. So when you start talking to Tom and ask about the parking, the, uh, the roof projects, well, the roof projects aren't there anymore in his budget. So I don't know if the budget liaisons covered that when they met with Tom, but this is how it, how it ended when the, uh, the board took their, their final vote and their final uh, offering of the budget to you for consideration. So, Thank you, Matt. Yep. What we're going to do is uh, start with uh, food service review, and then <coughs> if you have questions, well, it, I'd, unless it's a real general question, I'd rather have you ask the question when we're reviewing that particular budget. Or, oh, it's from the high school budget. Uh, go ahead. So my question is about uh, the transportation to practices that are not located on the high school property. So the, the cut is proposed at $33,000. So, and maybe this is a question for you, what does the board propose is the solution to get these students to off-site locations? Uh, currently, I know soccer can take existing buses, but I, I don't know about the other locations, and I really don't think it's a prudent idea to have other students drive students to practices. I think that puts them in a bad spot, and I put, think it puts the district in a bad spot, if anything were to happen. Let me, let me start. <clears throat> there was a total of $63,000 in, in that line, which I'm sure you, you look at in your budget book. And the thought process was the practices that go to like GPS field in Bedford, the soccer fields, uh, the ones that go outside of town of Merrimack would have transportation provided for them, just the ones within. So I'll leave that with Naomi. I think that um, it's a large and complex issue, and it's one that we've been talking about at the past school board meetings, and I imagine we'll be talking about for some time to come. Uh, we need a better solution even than, than putting bits of money towards it. There's issues with having money in the budget that isn't spent because there aren't drivers, regardless of whether it's there or not. There are issues of whether or not we need additional fields and what they should look like. And so essentially, this is not intended as a, a change in the services provided as much as the budget reflecting the reality of the past. Uh, as well as looking forward to better solutions moving forward. Okay, I appreciate that, but so so what is the temporary solution? So what would be the expectation for students that have practices at fields that not not reads, but um, I don't know, I don't know where tennis practice is, or I mean, are are there regular school buses that they could catch rides on that go by there? Is that the solution? I don't have a full answer to that. We're still figuring the answer out to that ourselves at the school board level. Okay. All set, Kevin? Okay. Carol or Mackenzie, do you have any questions on that high school issue? Not Maybe right not. now. Okay. Anybody else have questions on the high school issue? Okay. We're going to move on and we're going to start reviewing the budget for food service. I would ask David Zeki, who is the food service director, 
to come up. And um, before we get started, we'd like to just introduce everybody here at the table. Absolutely. And we're going to start off over there at Naomi. Naomi Schoenfeld, I represent the school board. Gillian Savage. Amanda Heidberger. Kevin Bobbitt. Stan Heinrich. Uh, Carol McKenzie, you want to introduce yourself, please? Sure, Carol Lang. And I'm McKenzie Murphy. Okay. Jordan Gualyumi. Brian Stisser. Lee French. Okay, Very thank good. you. Um, the liaisons for food service were myself, Brian Sisser, uh, and Kara Lang. Uh, we met with David uh, very recently, a few days ago, and he explained. And the reason I'm going first is because you asked me to. <laughs> Always. <laughs> At the meeting. Um, he explained his budget to us of the different federal programs that they're still getting paid for and uh, some new things coming down the pike, in particular a new uh, point of sale system that I think he will discuss with us in depth and also some other uh, replacements for things that are aging. And as you may or may not know, um, this budget is self-sustaining in that they sell lunches and that's how they pay for it. 99.9% it, it .9 of the time does not come from real estate taxes within the town. Uh, Carol, do you have anything to add to the food service budget? No, I don't think so. Okay. Brian. So you mentioned the uh, point of sale and two things, uh, point of sale system and two things that were brought up during the liaison meeting regarding the point of sale system. One was that it is necessitated by uh, the accounting auditors, uh, financial auditors due to the need for better accountability on the cash transactions um, because of the fact that it is primarily cash transactions uh, at the point of sale. There's a lot of potential for um, theft in there so therefore for robust accounting um, the auditors really pushed on having something that would maintain a, a more uh, robust <coughs> line of accountability and then also the new system is going to reduce uh, service costs on the legacy system because they are very uh, antiquated and when you count those reduce service costs, it is almost a wash on replacing the point of sale system. All set, Brian? Good. Yes. Okay. David, it's all yours. All right. I appreciate the, the comments. Um, I'd like to present the food service budget for 2019-2020. Um, Again, the significant item that we're looking at is replacement of the point of sale terminals in all six all six schools, um, including the point of sale terminals, um, barcode scanners, and uh, cash drawers that are e equipped with them. The um, a little background on the uh, lunch program: we are part of the uh, the New Hampshire Buying Group, which is a collaborative of 58 schools now, school districts, and um, <clears throat> we joined the collaborative a few years ago. That helps keep our um, costs in line. We have a, a larger uh, bid dollar now, so we get better costs in grocery items, um, paper products, and and produce. Um, so that does help very much. Um, as far as the uh, point of sales terminals, um, the major reason for replacing them is that the operating systems are getting uh, antiquated. And if I want to do any upgrades in, in my uh, software, um, those terminals wouldn't be able to accept any of that um, upgrade. So that's the reason really why I'm replacing those terminals. 
Some of those terminals have been here f since the inception probably 15 years ago. So um, they've served their, their purpose, and I hope th that the replacements will do the same. Um, <clears throat> as Brian mentioned, the uh, hardware contracts that we do have now um, <clears throat> in this would be eliminated next year, and uh, the new terminals would be under a five-year warranty. So that would, that would be about a wash with the, uh, the cost of contracts. <clears throat> Um, <clears throat> as far as everything else, I, you know, a lot of the uh, items that we do have are level funded. There's not a lot of change in, in any of the other um, budget lines. <clears throat> One thing I would like to mention in um, the, foods, the food purchases is that we do have, this year is the first year that we're um, able to use some of the um, commodity commodity allocation money to purchase fresh fruit and vegetables. So um, I have $40,000 allocated to fresh fruit and vegetables, which um, basically means I don't pay for those items. So I'm able to use the commodity um, value funds that we do have allocated to our, our district. Um, <clears throat> And that's that's the biggest biggest item that we have going this year. So I'm open to any questions. Questions for David. <clears throat> Mackenzie, do you have any questions? I do not. No. Carol, do you have any questions? No, I don't. Okay. Jordan. Can you recap uh, for some newer folks on the budget committee the issue with how we price our meals in order to stay in line with the reimbursement rate? So the, um, the paid lunch equity is um, something that the U.S. US government has uh, put in place. Um, basically, they want to um, ensure that we're charging um, an equal or greater value to what our uh, reimbursement rate is for free meals. Um, they did have a waiver this year in place that if we were, um, if our budget was, um, if we were in the positive, not a negative balance, um, that, that could be waived this year, which we did. So we didn't have to do an increase this year. So um, and unless something changes and we have to do it next year, we'll, we'll re- uh, uh, look at that next year. <clears throat> Any other questions? Carol or Mackenzie, you have any other questions? No, I do not. I will also say thank you for the fine snacks you provided <laughs> during your budget review. Absolutely. And uh, All whole grain products and healthy for you, Stan. And, and they tasted good. Yes, that they did. That was the most important part. <laughs> Absolutely. Of course, Carol didn't get to get me because we couldn't fit it through the phone line. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm still begrudging you that. <laughs> well, we'll save some for you, Carol. <laughs> oh, wonderful. <laughs> Seeing no other questions, I am going to say thank you, David. Appreciate it. Thank you. Next up on the list is student services. I would ask that John Fabrizio come up. John is the Director of Student Services. For some of you, you might think of it, know, known it beforehand in its previous name of Special Ed. Uh, the liaisons with David Ilk, Mackenzie Murphy, and Naomi Schoenfeld. And uh, David had asked that Naomi um, be the lead spokesman uh, for the meeting, seeing as how David could not be here tonight. So Naomi, I'm going to let. Well, actually, I'm, I I apologize, John. Would you like to go first, or would you like the liaisons to go first? Well, it's David and I. Well, first of all, good evening, everyone. And uh, David and I did speak, and um, he uh, asked me to go first. So I think that okay, uh, fine. For I Naomi's sake, Naomi. I will I will begin. Um, so to the, the new members of the, of, of the uh, budget committee and for the public, um, 
the special the special education slash student services budget um, really follows two major laws. So tonight I'll talk about kind of the two main governing laws. I'll talk about some total budgets and then some things that were added back in. Um, some number trends for you, because I think it's important to understand where we are with our, our numbers of students identified with, with, with our needs. And then uh, kind of what's driving the cost of, of my budget this year. And then um, kind of uh, I'll open it up to uh, some, I'll first I'll talk about some questions I received from the board and then kind of any questions from the committee, if that works for everybody. So first of all, two major laws. The first one's free and appropriate, free and appropriate public education, or FAPE. And really, um, when we talk about FAPE, free is the first part of that. And that means that um, an education for a student, no matter what his disability is, is provided at public expense. And it's up to us to provide that for a child and for a, a student with need. Um, it's provided with in the guidelines in the um, agreements under the IEP. It meets all of our state standards that are applied for us. It includes the students with disabilities um, that have been either suspended or expelled from our schools. It always includes the parents as part of the IEP team. It must be, um, it must be within all the conformity with the IEP to meet all the standards that lead us to a meaningful educational benefit for that student. It means basically the student needs to keep making progress within our schools, and we monitor that. And then um, it's determined by the team of educators, as I said, and that's multiple team of educators depending on the student and the student needs who sits at that table. And then the next law that talks about is least restrictive environment. Our number one place to always start and try is the regular ed classroom. Then from there, um, the least restrictive environment will tell you, okay, well now you have to try the classroom with some supports in it for students. If that's not working for us and the student's not making that, that meaningful educational progress, we move to um, possible other places within the building, a resource room. And we try to support them both in the classroom and the resource room. And as that goes forward, we continue to add layers to this and we try placements that really um, facilitate that ability to learn. Sometimes we make determinations within our district that we've, we've exhausted our options within our building. We've brought in resources. We've tried different placements. We've tried different rooms. And we have to make a decision to try alternative day schools outside of our school district. And then oftentimes those alternative day schools don't work. We move to residential placements. And then from there, um, when in those few occasions, a possible hospitalization. So those are two real laws that, that guide us. And they they're both um, have levels of progression to them to meet the student's needs. So this year, our total budget. Um, overall, um, my total budget uh, before the additions was up 1.95%. Uh, and then um, with the increase in the addition of the, um, the, the split air conditioners coming back in, my budget is now up to 2.2% overall. And that's, that's about a little over uh, $12 million, just to give you a, a figure to where I am, a, a total budget. <coughs> so let's talk about some numbers and trends. So in 2015-16, we had 665 students. Uh, 2017, two, two, 663 students. 17-18, 668 students. 18-19, currently we have 664 students. And I'm projecting about 660 students for next year. So as you can see with our, our progression of students, it stayed fairly steady over the last five years. Our numbers are staying consistent. They're seeing steady. Um, what we're seeing is um, an increase in kind of our preschool population. As many of you have known um, in, in, in have been in town, we've really increased our preschool programming over the past um, five years. And in doing so, we're bringing in more students um, that are typically developing and more students that maybe have special needs at, at that point. So um, there's also been a slight increase in the area of uh, emotional disabilities and students with other health impairments. But we've also seen a decrease in students with deaf blindness and with intellectual disabilities. So we've seen some trends that are happening within our district. So what's, what's causing this um, increase of 1.9% or 2.2%? 
Um, I mean, this year our transportation costs are going up about with our, with our existing contract we have with Carrying Hands. We're at a year where it's going up 3.5%. Um, then we also have a negotiated um, agreement with our, with our um, support staff association, our MESA association, and that's going up 3% this year in salary. I've also had an increase in the cost of occupational services, speech services, across all of, all of, the, all of my accounts, so off across the, the accounts that deal with those areas. And then we're also in the world of um, in technology and, and, and things we're putting in and is um, continue to build, put in sound field systems for our classrooms. I'm really trying to create environments for students that are universally designed to meet all of their needs. And that's something we continue to do and there's $17,000 in, uh, projected in this budget to be able to meet those needs. And then finally, I was asked a few questions by the board that I just want to highlight because I think it's important to uh, areas of the budget. I was asked about our tutoring accounts and kind of um, how um, my actual spending of those last year was a little bit over um, and the reasons why. And I explained to the board that um, we've had a, a, a lot of students who have been either hospitalized, injured, or long-term illness. And um, a requirement of law and regulation is that I need to provide tutoring for a student who um, is typically developing, who is not identified in special ed. They get about five hours a week. A student who is identified with a disability, they're offered up to 10 hours a week. And that is, um, there are several accounts at both the elementary, middle, and high school that I have to support that. And um, it's one of those things where um, we predict over a ratio of time, usually a three-year ratio. Matt and I look at the numbers, and that's where we come up with the number for that. And it's a, a projection because it's hard to predict who may be hospitalized next year, who may be ill next year, and it's one of those ones that we need to project out. Also, we asked a question about charter schools and other supports that I have for charter schools. Charter schools are public schools in New Hampshire, and if we have a student who um, parents choose to bring into a charter school, while I still remain as the legal, legal educational authority over that, the LEA, and then I have to provide the services in that school, or I, our office does, provide the services for that student in the school that they're going to. So if they're going to a charter school and they have speech therapy, I have to provide speech therapy for the charter school. And that's just, I just, it's one of those costs that are in our budget and I just need to highlight that. Also, um, I was asked questions around co-curricular activities and what those accounts are, are used for and why we have them. And I explained that under the law, I have to allow access to students with disabilities to participate in, in our after school activities. And um, if the IEP team determines the student is, is ability, that, that part of the team again is the parents, if the parents want to participate, or a teacher does, or there's an activity such as band or drama or um, integrated sports activities, then uh, the team decides how much that is. They write a referral to me. I, I, agree, I, I, I either agree or I ask questions to it. And then we allow for that to happen. And we fund the paraeducators through that, um, those accounts for co-curricular activities. I was also asked a question about specialized staff training. And do we um, offer training to all the coaches through that account? And I answered no, not at this time. Again, I explained that. Um, that the avenue to have training or um, co-curricular activities would come through that IEP team. They would determine what needed to be for that student and for that child and for that child and for what activities they were involved in. And that would be funneled through the coordinator to me to ask the permissions and then we would allocate the funds for that. So it wouldn't be a universal training for all during that. And then finally I was asked about the paraeducator accounts because there's some a spike in the ones uh, at a couple of the schools, and that's due to the fact that in those schools I happen to have veteran paraeducators, and um, their cost of 3% is higher than a, a newer paraeducator at 3%, and that's the reason why you see a spike in certain accounts versus others. And that is about all is my presentation. Naomi, would you like to add anything? Um, so as always, it was a, a marvelous meeting, and I always learn something, no matter how many times I have the chance to hear it. I think that there were two takeaways. The first is that the student services, um, from my perspective, and I believe David shares this, continue to meet the needs of, of all of our learners while balancing all the incredibly complex regulations and requirements that are overlaid in this particular area. Um, 
And we also enjoyed hearing about the fact that supports are being put in place not just for a particular student, but as far as UDL universal design, so that where possible, resources are put where they benefit a particular student, but also benefit the entire classroom and continue to do so, which is a really nice way to build whenever possible. Mackenzie, do you have anything to add to the report? Um, I do not. Okay. At this time, we'll open it up for questions. And I got Jordan's hand is going up. Uh, again. I have one also, oh. Stan. Okay. I'll get to you. Do you yeah. mind commenting on the state reimbursement and what's considered catastrophic aid. Um, I think that there's still, you know, we have new people here, but also for anybody that's watching on demand here, um, how that works. I think there's folks who don't quite understand that the state does sure. help out, but there's a formula for figuring, figuring out how much. Sure, so um, for students who have um, a lot of um, services and things like that, it's basically three and a half times the annual cost of educating a child. So it's basically, let's say it's, it's $15,000 to educate a child in special ed, it'd be three times that plus a half. So, and that's how it, would, would, how it comes out. And it's roughly um, around 55,000, 55, somewhere in that area of what we're looking for, $56,000 is what typically last year was. This year it's a little more. For those students that come into that area, I'm able to apply to the state for catastrophic aid, for what they call special ed aid, aid now. It was called catastrophic. Two years ago, changed to special ed aid. I'm able to apply, meeting a lot of criteria. So it's very regulated. Um, you have to um, track all of your services every um, day that the child's there. You can only account for. So if a child's absent, you can't account for them. If, uh, if uh, um, and all services rendered have to be done through catastrophic aid. So it's apply. I can. I can apply for it for the state for students who go over a certain amount of money. Are you guaranteed to get that, or if you've met all the criteria, they shouldn't reject it? I mean, what's the that? That's what I'm, what I'm here to talk about. If you mind, no, no. okay. What usually happens when we set the tax rate? Uh, we have a certain amount of catastrophic aid that if we would get 100 percent, it'd probably like be like 1.3 million dollars, right? And then the state gives me a range of, do you want to put 90% or you can go as low as 70%? In some years, they fund it at 70%. So you can only, even though you qualify and legally you should be getting $1.3 million, you could have a year where the state looks at its coffers and says, hmm, we don't have enough money to fund this fully, so we're going to fund it at 70%. And so that's why when I do my estimated revenues, I always pick the 70% number because it's happened before and I don't want it to happen again because if I put in closer to 80 or 90, I'll be looking for 1.2 million to come in. I only get 800,000, what, what's that? That's a $400,000 shortfall, which could put us in a deficit situation even if we had underexpended our budget because I haven't collected all the revenues. You remember Pembroke was uh, talking about tuitions, the estimated tuitions coming in from other districts. They wound up with an $800,000 deficit because they overestimated their revenues. So this is one of the things that I work out with DRA. I says, what's the lowest amount you legally you let me put in? And that's what I put in. And anything that we get over and above, and it's been rolling from year to year, gets put into surplus that reduces the school portion of the tax rate. So it's not like we're spending the extra, it's just that we're budgeting, budgeting conservative, because conservative can and would, it did happen in the past, but if we get more than we bargain for, then all that happens is it goes in to reduce the tax rate. Matt, would you uh, also uh, tell us when do you get this reimbursement? Well, I would get the reimbursement for this year in the uh, fall of next year. Comes a year later. Right. Yeah. So you're, not, you're not getting it in 30 days. No, no. no. And it comes over a course of uh, 
four installments or something like that. Nor is okay. it part of this budget. I just want to be clear, too, that it's not part of my student services budget that no. I'm presenting tonight. No. Jordan, you all set with that? Okay. Carol, you're next. Okay, a couple of questions. Uh, first one is, how many students do we currently have placed out of district? He's looking in his book, Carol, for the answer. Okay. All right. Okay, for 1819, I have 35 students placed out. Um, I'm projecting 34 for next year. Okay. Uh, my next question is, I've sort of lost track and I don't have all my paperwork in Florida. Do we still have money in the capital reserve for special ed? Yes, we do. Okay, uh, about how much do we have in there? Approximately $540,000, Carol. Okay, that sounds like we got that covered. And my last question, and maybe I'm just misunderstanding some numbers, but given the increased cost for bus transportation and the increased cost for the uh, car educator contract, with those two fairly substantial increases, and yet our overall increase is 1.95%, which leads me to think that something got cut somewhere to keep that down to 1.95%. Am I right or am I missing something? Carol, you are right when you do the, when you look at the increases. If you look at some of the auto district costs this year, they're down a little bit and that's, um, that's where we make up some of that money. Okay, all right, that makes sense. I guess I'm all set. Brian. For uh, reference, do you have any data on how Merrimack compares uh, nationally and with other districts in the state in terms of uh, special education requirements as a percentage of the student body and as a percentage of the total budget? I need to ask a little clarifier. When you say requirements, can you clarify a little so more? So how many students... Did, do you have any data on how Merrimack compares with other districts in terms of the percentage of students who require services and the percentage of the total school district budget that goes to uh, special education services? Um, for the first part of the question, we're about, um, we're about a little, little below average in the number of special ed students, that, that if you look at national standards and where we are. The nationally, they're increasing. We're not. We're staying very level, and we have for... <laughs> That's been a trend for about four years right now. We've stayed pretty, pretty level in our numbers, and our percentages stay, stayed pretty much the same, which is uh, unique in, in a way to a lot of other places in a lot of parts of the countries. Spending-wise, I don't have that data. No, I don't. Okay. Thank you. Lee. So I was just looking at the number of paraeducators that are listed per school. <clears throat> Uh, I see that Reed's Ferry has about 35. I'm, I'm guessing that you obviously put them where they're needed. But I see a, a, about a 50% increase from that school to the other schools. And I was just curious if you could explain that for me, please. Sure. Um, at, at Reed's Ferry, we ha we, um, in the three elementary schools, we um, have programs based on students' needs. And um, for example, we have um, a higher population of multi-disabled students at Reed's Ferry because of programming there. I have more supports there, in a way, for kids who are low-incident disabilities, such as autism, Down syndrome, 
multi-disabled students, kids that have a very um, higher need disability, there's more services there for them. Um, and doing so also takes more support from paraeducators, so that's why there's more there. Um, I explained earlier that um, where it lies, because the increase is a 3% increase, and I have a more veteran staff there, and that's really what causes it. I mean, if you, you make more, your, your increase is more. It's, that's really what, what it is in that. Uh, to follow up on that a little, <clears throat> I also see that in, in the elementary schools, there seem to be about, oh, 20 to 25 on average. And then when we go to the middle school, there's about 25 there. I, I'm just curious if we expect an increase of the children with needs to move into the middle schools, and will that increase the number needed there in the future as well? It's possible. The, the difference is, is sometimes kids are in the elementary school for seven years, and they, they start, and that's why the number you'll see there. It's only a two-year school in the middle and the upper, so therefore it, we don't need as, as, many, as many grade levels covered and supported, so it really is smaller. So that's why it stays um, over the last seven years. That stayed pretty consistently. Sometimes I have one or two that fluctuate based on need. Sometimes a kid may have a, uh, someone who signs and it makes sense to move that person along with them. Um, or someone who has a um, medical disability that we've done some specialized training with, um, and it makes some sense to do that. Other than that, um, no, we pretty, much, um, we pretty much stay pretty consistent within the numbers you see in, in, the, in, in, in these. Because often, um, often some of these are um, program-based. If I have a pro, like I have um, multiple, a multiple amount of um, paraeducators assigned to a program, and basically with kids in there, the numbers stay pretty consistent of kids in that program too. So it matches. Thank you for the clarification. Carol or Mackenzie, do you have any questions or comments? I'm all set. I'm also all set. Anybody else here at the table? John, over the years, um, and I'm going back a ways. We used to have a lot more kids without a district placement, correct or incorrect? You are correct. And you're down to about 35 now. Yes. And of those 35, are they full-time residential placements or are they getting bused there every day? Very few are residential placements. Often, um when you see a residential placement, a lot of times there are, um, we, like, as you know in our world, a lot of regulations and, and laws around that. A lot of times um, through court systems you'll see students placed and um, we sometimes split that and share that cost with some students. Other students um, needed more of a restrictive environment and yes, we've had to place residential. In the different places that you send these children, um, does the state or anybody have regulations as to how much they can charge you, or is it just a free will type of thing? So in New Hampshire, it's all regulated by what they can charge. However, in the new regulations, they're allowed um, a um, five per, up to a 5% increase each year. So um, they're allowed to cover their costs by increasing with cost of living plus. Um, to do that within, the, within New Hampshire. In Massachusetts, which we are close to the border, and sometimes I have a ge geographical commitment under the law that I have to place them with so close to their home. And being close to Massachusetts as we are, sometimes that closer residential or closer um, day placement is actually over the border. And they're not regulated by New Hampshire. So I often do sometimes get charged more than they would if they live in Massachusetts. Okay, thank you. Does anybody else have anything for David? Thank you very much. Thank you. We will be moving on to technology and library media services. I would ask Nancy Rose, our technology wizard guru, who fixed our phone system, to come on up. Uh, 
Nancy, before we begin, do you want to start or would you like your liaisons to start? Uh, Jordan has agreed to introduce my budget. Okay. Actually, the only thing we budgeted for was your new phone, Stan. That's the entire... <laughs> this isn't a new phone, and it's not mine. That's actually a uh, downgrade. By the way, the liaisons for this are Jordan, Brian Stisser, and Chuck. Go ahead, All Jordan. right, so we got together and walked through this, and this is a, a budget where there's a couple things going on. So if you're, if you're new to the committee or you're watching at home, uh, there's a couple issues here. And, and, and what it really comes down to are, I, I listed three things. One is moving forward because we are talking about technology and computers and um, things change and they get faster and better and, and things break and it costs a lot of money to keep older um, hardware and software uh, where it needs to be. So one, one, one issue here is moving forward. At the same time, we have to maintain what we have because if you can't afford to replace it, or it's not time to replace it, you need to make sure that you've got people and resources um, uh, available to keep the things that we have working. And then the third part to it would be an issue with compliance because one of the things in the budget here this year is actually um, reflecting some software purchases uh, necessary to ensure compliance with uh, what is called HB 1612 an amendment that talks about student data privacy and network security. So that's something that we're required to do um, in order to um, be in, in compliance with the law. Uh, with that said, um, there's only so much money to go around and you know we, we talked uh, it'd be you know it'd be wonderful if there was unlimited money to replace things, but um, some things don't need to be replaced yet. And, um, and the other part of it is uh, technology is always changing. And so uh, what, we, what we discussed was um, a combination of replacing, maintaining, and um, the highlight really coming out of uh, the budget this year is uh, updating the storage area network, which is nine, ten years old. Roughly. And um, so that's an expense this year in the budget. And then kind of um, an ongoing um, schedule of replacing computers and other kinds of things that need to be uh, need to be updated. Is that a good kind of overview of where we're at? Brian? So the only thing that I would add that stood out to me uh, was <coughs> in terms of that progressing versus maintaining um, having a balance of replacing things that are in need of replacement due to being antiquated or uh, simply being worn out by, by normal uh, wear and tear with more uh, current up-to-date items, devices, software. Um, so not upgrading for the sake of upgrading, but upgrading through attrition, uh, yeah. which really gives the most bang for the buck for the taxpayers. We had an interesting conversation, uh, I think it was a question you asked, Brian, which was about, you know, hey, are, you know, there's companies near, near us here. There's, there's companies in the Merrimack uh, area, you know, Fidelity and BAE and G, they must have, you know, they must have stuff that they're getting rid of that would still be great for us to use. But therein lies the issue if you get equipment like that and um, it's all in different conditions. So, you know, you could have 10 computers, but they're not all, in this, they're not all calibrated the same way. And, um, and now you've got an enormous um, cost of, of keeping the, of upgrading and, and keeping that, um, that hardware up to date. Um, so it, it really isn't, you know, hey, the more we can get, the better. Uh, we, don't, we don't really want things that put a burden on, on your um, already, um, you know, limited staff. So um, with that, I guess I'd let you kind of delve further into Okay, the thank you. You did a very good job. Thank, thank you. You. Um, I, you. You really hit the high points. I think the only, um, picking up on what Brian was saying about the replacement, the other constraint or demand that we have on us is that there's just simply a demand for more devices. So we have to replace what we currently have, um, but we are trying to also increase the devices that students have access to. And that's a challenge that won't be going away. And I think that this was part of the board presentation is how do we 
get innovative in what we can do to increase access to technology for students. Um, and then regarding the HP 1612 amendment, um, the only thing that I would say about um, what Jordan was saying, which was accurate, is the, the law has a lot of moving parts, and so it involves a, um, it's protection of student and staff data that we hold, as well as the data that leaves the district, and it, it requires a um, data breach plan and a full inventory of every single piece of software or application that gets used for instruction um, and the fact that it complies with the regulations and that we have our hands on the terms of service and the privacy agreement. And so we'll have to create workflows to manage that for every educator in the district. So it's a, it's a complex law with a lot of different parts that will require different ways of solving each problem. So, but otherwise, that's, that's really where the, the changes in my budget this year lie. All set, Nancy? I'm all set. I'll just add one more stat that I picked up and tell me if this was wrong, but you're currently servicing or you're currently managing um, almost 3,000 different devices between iPads and computers and laptops and whiteboards and all, everything that's connected and um, it's almost 3,000 different pieces of equipment. It's probably more than that if you include instructional technologies. All yours, Stan. Carol, do you have any questions? Yeah, a couple. Um, one is, can you go into a little more detail? I'm looking on page seven. Uh, where you're talking about the voice over internet phones and then you kind of shift gears in there and you're talking about computers being wired through the phones and I'm kind of surprised at that maybe I'm behind what the technology is but I would think most of our uh, computers would be connecting through the internet so how are the phones involved in that? Um, the a lot of our classrooms have one or two network jacks, and so one way we can save on network jacks is we plug the telephone into the network jack, because it uses an ethernet connection, and then it passes that connection through to the computer. So the phone is just essentially a pass-through, um, and it's one way that we can save on cabling. So that's all that is. However, the network capability of the phone may only go to uh, 100 meg per second, and our network switches in many places are up to a gigabit per second, and so that ch that's a challenge for us if the phone slows down the, ne the network connection to the computer. So as we start replacing phones, we will be working on getting gigabit-capable phones. So it's just moving speeds of different equipment and cables up along as we keep moving forward. Did that make sense? Okay. Yep, yeah, I okay. gotcha. Okay. Okay, now I'm going back to one page prior to that and line six where you say expand, update computers. And it's $172,000. What are we getting for that? So that line is where we both purchase and we purchase new computers and also replace existing computers. And it represents lease payments over the last three three years plus um, what we're planning to do next year. So that's a cost that stays. We try to keep it fairly level, um, but with that we're able to kind of buy a bigger chunk every year rather than only buying a very small amount every year. And we've been doing that for about four years now. So what, what's the average age of our computers? Um, our desktops are getting to where they're only about seven or eight years old, um, which is better from when I first got here when it was between 10 and 14 years old for a desktop computer. Um, laptops, uh -huh. um, most of our laptops for staff, they tend to, we're, we're trying to replenish those so that the, the laptop is used for about four years. But what ends up happening with both student and staff laptops is we end up in sort of a hand-me-down situation. So we, we buy new, we take what there is being replaced, and we, if it can be re-imaged and have memory added and be reused, we put it back into circulation for a few more years. Um, with student laptops that we've replaced this year, we've been able to service them and then put them into classrooms for students to use within the classroom 
with the understanding that when they die, they go away, so that we don't sink a lot of technology or technician cost into those. So we have newer equipment that's regular use for staff and students that's within a four or five year time period, and then we have older devices that are around for extras in the classroom or for um, extra kinds of programs or for a lot of paraeducators don't always have access to a regular computer, so this is a way that they can have access to a computer. Um, so it's a lot of rolling use, but the day-to-day high-functioning machines are usually within a four-year cycle. Okay, sounds good. And other than that, I just want to express my appreciation for your resolving our phone issue. <laughs> I ap apologize that we had it in the first place. Well. At least it proved that it needed fixing, and we caught it, and it, it got fixed. So in the end, it's all good. Oh, thank you. Mackenzie, do you have any questions or comments? <laughs> I'm all set. Thanks, Dan. OK. Anybody here at the table have any questions or comments? To think back when you used to have card catalogs. No more. Now it's all electronic and you do a good job at it. So thank you. Well, seeing no hands up, I'm gonna say thank you very much. All right. I hope when you walk out of the building that this thing is still running. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know how to redial. <laughs> thank you. How uh, we thank you. Next up on the list is our lovely maintenance department. And I would invite Tom Tussaud up. Tom's the director of maintenance. Uh, liaisons were myself, Carol Lang, and Gillian, and Lee. And Tom, uh, yeah, Tom has asked us, the liaisons, to go first. Um, if you notice, a lot of the things on the budget were maintenance items. He has the budget that usually gets cut the most. Um, this first year I've seen he didn't lose a whole heck of a lot, which was nice. Uh, in the maintenance budget, you'll, you'll see money for new boilers, which Tom can explain in detail uh, as to why we need new boilers um, and why we're not getting a new roof that has been taken out of the budget. Uh, I was very concerned about that, uh, given the past problems we've had with other roofs in the district in the past. Um, but Tom assures me that um, unless we get some bolt of lightning that hits, we should be, uh, we will be okay for the next year. And uh, that's why it got uh, taken out. Uh, you'll also see money in this budget for doing different windows. Again, they're worn out and need to be replaced, and the school board did put them back in the budget. Uh, he has the same labor contract with his employees that the other the Messer employees do, so they will all be getting their normal raises. Uh, he also has a variety of equipment to take care of, uh, such as some pretty heavy duty, for lack of a, a better word, lawnmowers that are very expensive units to maintain the school district fields. And he gets in charge of making sure that we have all the supplies that are needed for cleaning uh, and keeping the schools looking in tip-top shape, and they're also the people, and comes out of his budget, that set up the rooms for these meetings and other things. Um, I, I think his budget reflects uh, our needs, and uh, it should uh, be very successful in this coming year. And with that, I'll ask Carol, do you have anything else you'd like to add on that? Um. One thing that struck me as odd, and he explained it, but in case anybody else was wondering about it, was that transformer for the high school. 
that I guess we're converting the transformer to a leased unit rather than owning it because owning it exposes us to unpredictable costs if there's a problem. But the part that struck me as odd, but I guess it's what the way it is, is that we still have to pay to install it even though then we're going to lease it. Okay. I, he can explain that. Anything else, Carol? Um, only if he got an answer to the question I posed to him about that uh, retrofit thing on page 8. And he's shaking his head yes, so I guess he'll be addressing it. Okay. Gillian, do you have anything? And Lee? Okay, Tom, it's all yours. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for having me here. I'd like to start off by talking about a couple of uh, major items in the upcoming budget, and one would be boilers at Mastercola Elementary School. Last year, uh, the school board had our contract to do a survey of all our individual uh, HVA equipment and stuff like that. Out of that, we've uh, gained that the average life of a boiler is roughly 30 years. Uh, so we started thinking at that time, how do we start addressing this and to address it as soon as we can and wh why we decided to go with Mastercola Elementary School. Uh, Mastercola Elementary School has kind of some unique things about it. It's the only school that we are operating with a large boiler and a very small boiler. I would say it's about a third of the size. Uh, most all our schools, except for the high school that has three boilers, uh, <clears throat> if one goes down, we have an equal to keep the school warm. At Mastercola Elementary School, if one goes down, if it's the large one, we're really in trouble because our needs aren't even going to be close to being kept. And on peak days, we're using both boilers running to keep our schools warm enough. So th the idea was start off with Mastercola Elementary School, put in two different types of boilers, condenser boilers. Uh, one of the problems they had originally and the reason why they went with one large boiler and one small boiler was due to constraint of size. Uh, condensive boilers are highly efficient and they are actually smaller so they can fit in the existing footprint. And that's one reason why, that's the reason why we went with Mastercola Elementary Schools to replace their boilers first. Uh, I would imagine that in the upcoming years that we'll be looking for SIP items as far as the other boilers and looking how to lay that out in the future. But at this point, we started off with Mastercola Elementary School. The next item I'd like to touch base with, with you on is the transformer. And Carol talked about that a little earlier. The transformer at the high school needs to be replaced. We ran into that the same time we ran into the switch gear issue when we had an electrical engineer out doing studies. He recommended to us that we would replace the transformer. When we started looking into replacing the transformer, things things start showing up. Uh, one thing I did I was not aware of uh, out of all of the transformers in the school district, we actually own two. We own one at the high school. The other one at the high school is a lease. We own one at Mastercola Upper Elementary School, and all the other ones in the district are owned by public service. So what you will see in our this coming budget is money, the $75,000, and that's only to take out our old transformer, put in a new one. They will not pay to put in one. They will pay to, they'll lease it to us, but they won't pay to uh, replace it. I mean, to put it in. So that's why you see that 75,000. Now later on in my budget, you're gonna see where we're into electrical at the high school. There's also, we went with the highest two years expenditures, but in the high school line, there's also a charge, approximately $390 a month that we're gonna be, that's going to be a lease program. Now that's going to go for eternity. The upside to that, if we have an issue, it is Eversources. And if whatever problem, they need to come and fix it. 
The good side for us is we don't have to lay out roughly $200,000 out front to pay for it. So that's kind of that whole thing in a nutshell, I would say. Um, so you will see an increase in the high school electric line. Not only is the highest years in the last two years, you'll also see a $400 a month expense in there. Um, I want to address Carol's question because actually when we were in the meeting, she asked me and I go, boy, I actually should know this, but it, it just, just lost that for a second. Let me get back to page seven. And what that was in, in account 14640-8450-OA on page eight, <clears throat> there is a significant decrease in our uh, retrofit costs for our payments. And that's because that year in 2000, let's see, I'd say 1718, that we paid that we paid that. That was our last payment for when we did the gas conversion, and that's why it's a little different. One is still carrying the overall Honeywell contract, the energy audit that we did, and all the work, but also was added on there was the gas conversion that was much shorter. That was, I think that was only four years, and it, it ended, and that's why it seems much less today than it did in 2017-18. With that, I'm open for any questions that might anybody might have. Questions from anybody at the table? I've got one, Stan. Okay, Carol, hold on. Amanda. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm just curious on page two, your um, rubbish disposal, does that include um, recycling or do you guys recycle at the, high, um, the school district and does that reduce cost by recycling or is that adding to the cost? It does include recycling. It is a, it's the right thing to do. It does decrease the cost in some ways. Um, one thing you definitely see on page two is a little bit of a spike there, and that's just because every year we put our trash out for bid or the disposal out to bid, and that um, we the vendor normally has won the account for the last seven or eight years, did not bid this year. So it was very unfortunate, uh, hopefully next year, that we're gonna get more competitive bids, but at this point, uh, we're thinking that we have to cover ourselves. So we put in a figure that would take us through. Thank you. Carol, you're next. Um, I'm just wondering, going back to the transformer, we're paying to install it this time, then we go to leasing it. Someday down the road, it will eventually need to be replaced again. At that point, since it's a lease, will we have to pay an installation cost again, or will that just be covered by our lease? That could take place in another 35, 40 years, and honestly, I have not looked into that. I believe that if it's leased, they would take care of it. Uh, Brian, you're next. Yeah, right, Kevin, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm looking that way, seeing that way. Not good. You had your hand up, I apologize. Thanks, Stan. Uh, just two questions, one is on uh, maintenance of ground supplies, uh, the, the various fields. How much, it looks like it's $38,000. How much of that is spent on the the, uh, the main stadium field here at the high school? We really don't have it broken down to that. Out of that $30,000, if I'm roughly guessing, I would think it's right around a quarter of that would go to that. Okay. But I don't really have that number for you, sorry. Okay. And the other question I have has to do with the red building that we now own. Um, quick scan, looks like in your budget there's almost $15,000 worth of cost budgeted just to own this building. Are there other costs that are elsewhere in the budget? And maybe that's a, maybe not a question for you, but basically what does it cost to have this building sit there? Well, th there are costs as far as, what, what we did is basically Matt inquired 
and we took costs that they gave us for gas, oil, um, electrical costs. That's that's in our budget, and be honest, it's just our best guess at this time. We really don't know. It depends on what, what, and if we ever use it for something. Kevin, currently, the building cannot be used. That's my understanding, and that's why right. I, my question is, is, is: Does it cost more if, than fifteen thousand dollars a year to not use the building? That's my question. Um, if they, if the school board decided they wanted to use that building, it's going to cost some major upgrade things. It was going to cost at least fifteen or sixteen thousand dollars just to upgrade the fire alarm system, without doing anything else. Uh, this money was put in. Uh, on a general anticipation of what it was costing the people who used to be there um, to keep the building up. Now, what temperature they're going to keep the heat at now because there's nobody there or not, I don't think anybody knows. Um, and we all heard different stories of that building. Um, my, my personal belief is that a D9 Caterpillar is going to do a wonderful job on it. And that would be the best way to spend our money. And correct me if I'm wrong, Matt, but if we don't use any of that money for the red building, and thank you for calling it the red building, by the way. It is red. That's right, it is. It's listed as Brentwood in the, in the budget book because there was no <coughs> other way to put it in. Um, that money goes back to reduce the tax rate if we don't spend it, right? Yeah, that that's correct. Uh, right now, you know, we're keeping the building heated at a nominal level. We use the numbers from Ceres from last year. They weren't using it to its capacity anyway, so they were keeping it at minimal levels also. So we don't expect to to pay more significantly less. You got to remember that building's ten thousand square feet, so it, it, it's quite a a, a big structure with um, not exactly energy efficient windows in there. The windows are old, they need to be replaced. And so, uh, you know, the board, board has two options. If they want to use it, first thing they have to do is put a new sprinkler system in there, $15,000. $15, we, got, we got that figure. And then you have to look at the, the handicap ramps that are there. Those all have to be done. The eternal railings of the building all have to be done because they're not the right height for ADA. There's some doors that need to be retrofitted for ADA purposes. Uh, there's some holes in the walls that need to be patched. There's a lot of work internally to be done just to maintain the same configuration that it is now and then to use it in some sort of limited capacity. So the 15,000 is kind of the tip of the iceberg. There is, there is an option in order to, Tom and I have talked about this, to uh, perhaps drain all the lines, put it in kind of cold storage. Uh, we would have to then uh, notify the fire department that it's not being used. And if we do that, we'd have to physically board up every window and every door uh, as to not have anybody gain entrance because when a building's been, let's call it abandoned, the fire department wants an assurance that there's nobody in there. There could be somebody in there and you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't know. So if it's all boarded up and all the boards are there, fire department is fairly certain there's nobody in there that they have to go rescue. So that's the whole premise behind that. But right now, it's the thought that Perhaps it could be used for something next year. Um, and so we're going forward. We have a quote for $15,000 for sprinkler system. And that was just information given to the board for their consideration. What they're going to do with that in the future, I have no idea. But we're just waiting until we can make something better happen, obviously. I'll say Kevin. No, so is the fifteen thousand dollars for the sprinkler system in the budget? And no, I just it didn't is see not. It? No, okay, it is so not. Okay, so the 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 fifteen, roughly fifteen, is to do nothing with it, and then it's another fifteen if we want to do something minimal with it. Starting, just starting, 15. right? Okay, exactly. but that's not in the budget yet. No. Okay, thank you. 
Carol, I think you were next. Um, I was wondering, I, I realize we can't use the red building for any active use, but can we use it if we needed it, say, for storage or something? We've had a conversation with um, John Manuelli and the, John Manuel and the, uh, the fire chief, and without a functioning sprinkler system that's up to code and covers all the areas that it does need, we could use it for minimal storage, but their concern is us using it for a large amount of storage, which would entail it having uh, excess combustible mass inside the building if you have a lot of papers and a lot of files and a lot of whatever. Uh, so they don't want that to happen. We could, we could use it for, you know, if we had some some uh, chairs that we're no longer using and we wanted to store them in there, we could use it for that. But we'd have to upgrade the fire alarm system before we would have, before we could do anything and get into the building, even storage wise. All right, and then I'm still kind of, you, you touched on what I was originally going to ask about was why we couldn't just put it in cold storage, and you kind of answered that, but there's a piece of me that hates to heat a building that's not being used, and, you know, I don't, I don't know, you know, how detailed an, an analysis has been done as to how, how long down the road are we going to have to keep heating this building versus the cost that would be a one-time cost of boarding everything up. Well, that, that'll be a discussion I'm sure the school board would have in public uh, with various options and how they want to proceed. So it's, it's nothing that administration is going to make a decision on. It's going to be a board decision. So, Naomi, please. And Naomi, go ahead. A decision to board it up could always be made. Um, I think that the point is that it's prudent to take the costs that have existed in the past and budget them so that we know that we're covered regardless of what the information we have moving forward. We don't know what it will cost. And so taking the past information and using it as a basis for this budget just seems a, a prudent move. I originally saw some hands up over here earlier. Brian? So I just wanted to on that transformer a little bit more, okay. um, particularly because you mentioned the number across the district. Um, so roughly doing the math, the break-even point on lease versus buy looked like it was 42 or 43 years. Um, I feel like you indirectly said 35 to 40 years was the life expectancy on a transformer. Did I understand that correctly? That was my guess. I, I would say 35, okay. maybe 40 years. Could, could be so generally range. speaking, over the life of the transformer, the lease is actually the less expensive of the two options, just on equipment, not counting maintenance. Do I understand that correctly? I would say yes. Okay, thank you. And, and if I could add something. When you, Tom and I talked about this with um, George, I forget his last name, from Eversource, and when you, when you lease it and your transformer is down and Eversource owns it, they have those things in stock. Yep. So they'll come, they'll right away, and you get top priority. And, and the technicians on staff. Then. Yeah, correct. And it's a, if it's a transformer that you own, then you probably wouldn't get the same level of service, you know, that you would have if it's their transformer. And Eversource, great company. We've worked with them very closely. And, you know, I trust them to, to take care of us when we're uh, in need. They always have. And so they've, they've been on site. We've had our engineer on site. They're actually looking at the transformer, designing the, the new conduit that has to come in underground to hit the new switch gear. So it's all part of one design scope right now, which we're having our engineer work out working with Eversource and then working with custom and then trying to get everything because you know when you've had something in there since 1970 Seven. 1977 um, footprints have changed where the conduit comes up through the floor changes um, we may have to move some concrete a little bit so 
we wanted engineered as one particular unit. So if we're working with Eversource and we're working with Custom and we have Ackroyd Engineering, we hired them out of Manchester, New Hampshire. Uh, they were recommended by uh, the fire chief. And if they're recommended by the fire chief, I feel good about that because he's going to give us a, a full set of stamp plans, how it's going to look and <coughs> how it's going to be. And uh, that'll be run past the fire chief, the fire marshal, so everything's done cohesively and everything works together the way it should. So in the end, we should have a good product, and that's what we want to do. And the installation cost, would that be any different for owned versus leased? The, ins the installation cost of, of uh, the transformer. The transformer? No, I would imagine it wouldn't be. I, I don't. Think I assumed as much, I don't think we will get a cost if something if something goes wrong with that. They'll come and fix it. Yep. Oh yeah. And if yeah, they have yeah. to move it, they'll they'll if they, if they have to give us a new one and it's leased, they're going to give us a new one and hook it up. Yeah. You know because it's yep. going to be spec'd out to the latest transformers that they have in stock now, not the one they put there in 1977. Uh, so it'll it should it should drop right in and just be able to go. Okay. At least Thank that's you. the design hope. Amanda. My question actually goes back to the red building, um, and this isn't quite prudent with this budget. But now that we have the red building, what kind of timeline are we going to have for figuring out what exactly we're going to do with it and costs? Are we going to as um, are the taxpayers going to be posed a couple different plans and they decide or how what's the ultimate goal with this building and what timeline are we going to see with this well i'm i'm personally not um conversant in the marketing strategy and the in the timeline as far as that goes um we're just trying to present what we need to do to keep it running if the board chooses to run it if they choose not to run it, then we have a certain sum in the budget in order to, to board it up to take care of that. Um, as far as future use and what the timeline may be, and if the voters are going to be presented with one option, option A, option B, option C, that's always very difficult to do, especially in a Warren article, which this would have to be. I think it would be the planning and school district planning and building committee uh, working with the school board working with administration to come up with uh, to review all the options and come up with a cohesive plan that would be presented and put forward to the voters timeline of which I, I don't know um, I know years ago when um, pay to pay to pay to throw was on the ballot and it was option A, option B, option, sh option C. I looked at that thing, and I've been doing warrant articles for 25 years. I couldn't make head and tails of it. And so we want to we wanna make whatever we do, we want to make it clear, and we want to make it understood, and we want to get all parties involved in order to come to a, a unanimous decision that makes sense for all stakeholders. But timeline, I, I can't say. Amanda, one of the other choices that the school board has is to say we're going to totally tear it down mm -hmm. first and then go from there afterwards and the unfortunate part of that too is that there's a cost involved with that mm -hmm. yeah. and Matt has already figured out that cost <coughs> should they decide to go and tear it down and we start from scratch so if I'm understanding it correctly the school board is going to decide whether to tear down or remodel in place and then they're going to go from there uh, I would say that would be a fair assumption. Okay. Yeah. I, I just want to know that there's some kind of plan going forward. It's not just going to sit here in limbo and we it, pay money for to something. Be, to be quite be frank, paid. and I don't care if I cork somebody off, uh, when that property was bought, it was bought for the property. It wasn't bought for that 60-year-old building <coughs> that was built by the same person who built the red building and the, the green building and the blue building. It's very antiquated. Um, if anybody, th you know, thought that you could sell it commercially, you couldn't because of a variety of problems. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, if the school board wants to try and pour money into it. Good luck. Okay. All right. 
right, thank you. Other questions? Mackenzie, you have any questions? I do not. Gillian. Carol, do you have any questions? I think I heard somebody else with a question, so go to them and come back to me because I'm still pondering. Okay, ponder, ponder. Gillian, go <laughs> right ahead. Um, this actually just goes back to the red building, and it was sort of touched upon already, but I just wanted to know, because um, I too supported it for the value of the property, not the building on it. Um, and Matt, you said that the sprinklers need to be replaced and it needs to come up to ADA compliance, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. What's the figure just to tear it down so you have a basis of comparison? Uh, Tom and I talked with a local contractor who is known to us who does excellent work, and the price is around 250000 you have to take it down. You have to realize it, there could be asbestos in there. We definitely know there's asbestos on the bottom floor, right, Tom? Yes. Yeah, okay. But would that need to be abated to that use it? That would need to be abated abate. before it's torn down. Would it that need to be abated to use it going forward if you did want to remodel it? If we wanted to use the bottom floor, we could just leave, you know, the carpet over it and call it contained, but mm -hmm. that's not the best thing to do. We would have to abate that, but we've gotten pretty good at that in the past. So that would be a cost, whether it was yeah. refurbished or just mm -hmm. gotten rid of. Yeah, but we, we would have to basically go in there, take it apart like a Lego kit, and because it's so close to the mm -hmm. abutting property, um, we wouldn't want to do any disturbance as far as that goes. So as much as Stan, and he said it around four times right now, <laughs> would like to take a, a D5 bulldozer. No, no, D9. D9. D5 isn't big enough. D, D9 bulldozer. We're going to have to work that out, Tom. There you go. Uh, so Stan can get behind the controls of one of those. Uh, we, we just can't get in there. It has to be uh, kind of a systematic type thing. Okay. But there will be a D9 bulldozer there at some point. Yeah. I know. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Okay, thanks. I just thanks. wanted to know if you had a, a point of comparison for one-time destruction yeah. cost versus constant repairing. Correct. Shaw's wants a third location in town, so we're, <laughs> we're, we're actually thinking about a, they're going to put a dairy section in and a, more, more to come. Not another Shaw's. <laughs> Carol, you had a question, comment? No, I think I, I think I worked it out, so I'm all set. Okay. Anybody else? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. At this time, we are going to take a five-minute recess, but Carol and Mackenzie, I'm going to leave you on the phone because I don't feel like dialing again. So you'll get That's to hear fine. dead airspace. We are yeah, in recess for five from minutes. From you could take... Back in session. At this point in time, we saved the best for last. The district-wide budget. I would ask the administrative team to come on down. Um, liaisons for a district-wide were myself, Brian, and Carol. And Marge, would you like to do the all formal introductions of your folks at the table with you, please? Surely. Don't we know all of you, just for the record? Sure. To my left, the Assistant Superintendent of Curriculum Instruction and Assessment, Dr. Mark McLaughlin. To my right, the Assistant Superintendent for Business, Matt Chevenel. And I'm Marge Chaffrey, the Superintendent. And would you like to go first, or would you like us to go first? I would love my liaisons to go first, please. Okay. We had a very nice meeting with the administrative team. Um, yes, it's a very big budget. Just to give you a couple of three numbers that uh, we bantered around of fixed costs. There's a 13.7% increase this year in health insurance. There's a 2.3% increase in dental insurance. And there's a 17.8% increase 
in retirement. These are all contracted things that uh, we have to fund and it's very unfortunate um, that the state took away their obligation of helping to pay for retirement. Uh, the health insurance, um, yeah, we took a little bit of a hit, but um, they had more experiences this year and it cost more money and it's a lot less money than uh, other districts and towns have paid for increases. Uh, we still have a fairly healthy bunch uh, in Merrimack and there's like, what about five, over 500 people on the health care system? 700. As 700, as okay. Employees and then we have the employees' spouses. Right. Children. And the uh, school district employees do pay towards their health care. Their health care is based on an HMO plan and it's been contracted with the teachers and the support staff. Um, a lot of the things are fixed costs and we have to run the schools to educate our children, plain and simple. And with that, I'll ask Carol if she's got anything else she wants to add. Um, just a couple of things. Mostly, the first thing is mainly for people that are new on our committee is that health care increase is the maximum it can go up. When they actually price it, it could potentially be less than that. So that isn't an absolute figure. And the other thing was we were having phone problems the day we reviewed this budget, too. So I didn't get to ask Matt then, so I'll ask him now. And this affects not just district-wide, but it kind of ran over into I was seeing it in the maintenance budget and other budgets too. But did you factor in when you were looking at postage that there was just a 10% increase in postage rates? Oh, when we did the uh, three-year average, we, uh, we bumped up the three-year average uh, 10%. And so the, the, the rate you see there includes the increase in postage. We just didn't write it out as a 10% increase, but it was factored into the three-year average. Okay, fine. Yeah. <clears throat> Brian, you have anything to add? So just to draw attention again on the uh, up to 13.7% increase on the district's cost on just the health insurance uh, that is a little bit over 1.5 million. The entire uh, variance from 18-19 school year to the proposed budget for 1920 is just over a million. So the increase in the district's cost on health care is greater than the total budgetary increase, uh, meaning this year's the proposed budget is actually leaner minus that one cost. Marge, it's all yours. Thank you. I appreciate uh, what the liaison said. Thank you. And I'm just going to ask Matt to highlight one more cost, which is transportation, because that's kind of the fourth. There were four main elements um, that were really looked to be the largest elements, and that's another one. So will you hit transportation, please? Yeah, transportation is a uh, contract. Uh, five-year contract we've got two more years to go in the contract with STA STA has been a, a, a wonderful um, vendor to deal with I don't like to call them a, a vendor per se because they become part of our, our school culture the elementary schools have breakfast for bus drivers and everything like that and bus drivers go through a lot of training that we offer as a district so we have kind of brought them into our, our family and kind of tried to impart as much knowledge we had on of discipline and how to handle situations to them uh, free, free of charge. They do offer it themselves. Um, the, the company itself has made a significant investment in, in Merrimack with their new facilities, which I think uh, 
despite everybody's apprehension about its location, seems to have worked out pretty good. Uh, the transportation increase is 3.5%, and that added another $79,000. When you, you know, our budget includes LTD, FICA New Hampshire Retirement for professional staff and teachers, uh, support staff improvement, all the, the, uh, the workshops, the graduate studies, everything that's in the teacher's contract, contractual obligations is in the district budget. There is uh, some good news at the end of the tunnel coming pretty soon that uh, right now we have two bond issues outstanding, one for Merrimack Middle School, which was a 20-year 20, um, 20 bond. The school opened in 2004, so 2324, that bond is going to be the last payment for the middle school. So after that, approximately... Eight hundred plus thousand dollars is going to go away from the budget, and then the Merrimack High School addition, which was I think it was a twenty-year bond too on five point nine million dollars, is going away in twenty twenty-one. So in a few years, uh, there's going to be uh, one point two million dollars just written off the books of cost, which is. Putting, in us, putting us in a very advantageous situation to either feather something in, not quite as much as that, but to look at some other capital improvements we may want to look at <clears throat> and uh, take them out a little bit long term or just ride with the no debt scenario, which is always terrific to be in and uh, stay the course. So that, that's, a, that, that's a significant milestone. Um, when I first started, I, I wasn't sure, I don't want to say I wasn't sure if I was going to see it, but it was kind of a long ways away, and now that way is here. So it's very, it's very gratifying to finally see those buildings and the addition. If you don't know what I'm talking about, the high school addition, because you, you haven't been here since the year 2000, it's the three-story piece over there, feet from our green um, the greenhouse, our uh, business office suite, our superintendent's office. That's about all I. <laughs> I like to call our lower level. Yeah, it's, you know it's, that, right? It's a Motel I, Six suite. No, when when I when I when, when I invite people down, I have vendors over and whatnot, and I have roofing people and contractors. This is let me escort you to the business office suite, and so they go down the stairs. It's a little thing. I just like to do it. It's nice, you know, and, and people kind of get a, get a chuckle. So it's, hey, it served us well. Uh, I don't think, um, you know, a new office would be terrific. Obviously, everybody would like a new office from an air quality standpoint and from a logistics standpoint. We don't have a, you know, I don't want to sound like I'm whining, but there's no conference room. The kitchen is the conference room. So you've got to move the birthday cake out of the way to do an orientation with a new person coming in. And it's kind of like, oh my gosh, my elbow just went in the birthday cake. I'm sorry about that. But it, it's, it's just kind of not, not functional. And we have gone all over the district at times to look for a meeting space to hold our, our staff meetings. And even in teacher contract negotiations, we have to use the high school conference room, which is fine. Nobody minds. But sometimes that's taken up with other things that goes on. So we have to run around the district looking for space. I think the one thing that, that, that we would like would be to all be on the same floor um, to have adequate heat and HVAC, because it can be challenging in that building when you're living there. Um, I don't think my office gets above 62, 63 degrees. That's probably why I look so good at the ripe old age of 75. Uh, anyway, I'm only kidding. Uh, so, so anyway, it would be nice to have that. It would be nice to have a conference room. And it has to have, nice to be, have some good working space that would flow better and allow us to engage one another more. You know, I always know when Marge comes in the office because I can hear the heels walking across the hallway and I can hear her walk into her office because she's right above me. So then I, wait, I, I try and catch her before the red light goes on the phone and I hit the button right away. So it'd so, be nice. So what Matt has done is visioning 
about yeah, I'm what's sorry. to be yeah, just, you know. relative to if you were picturing what the red house might turn into. He just gave you a vision of what we've thought of, but it's not in this budget. No. So um, we have to put that off for another year um, or do more talk about it. Um, but seriously, he, he um, summed up. Um, the last piece of this budget which were really the four big items that is in our part and I think if you look at the whole I would hope you would say this after you look at the entire budget because we've now done all the presentations that we came to the table having listened to the board's message and tried to balance what the needs of our children are the needs of our students um, up against what we think the taxpayers can bear and so it was really trying to be prudent while taking in the needs of our, our students. And I would hope you would think the same. But now what we're prepared to do is to answer any question you would have about our section. You all set, Matt, or you keep them going? Oh, I think, I think I'm all set. I think I've <laughs> gone off on a little bit of a tangent, and uh, I'm, I'm done for now. Thank you. It wasn't a tangent at all. You were expressing your personal views of what you would be utopia. Marge said it was visioning, so that's what we will call it, visioning. Yeah, well, it's good we have a visionary in the, in the house. <coughs> Any questions for the administration? Kevin. Uh, somebody had mentioned uh, the large percentage of kind of fixed costs, things that were already kind of agreed to or locked into via contracts. What is the actual number? The, so the total budget proposed is 78 million something like that what 77 77 yeah now so what um, is the actual not percentage but what's the number well the fixed costs that that, that we have for health and everything that else that, that, that you, we talked about is one million seven hundred fifty four thousand dollars I guess I um, we have there's other things that we can't change I guess in in the budget so whether it would be you know property taxes or, or, or there's I guess there's not but things like um, utilities things utilities, that utilities labor contracts right all that what's that number out of the 77 million leases things like that right that, you know, as far as a car payment on the on a maintenance truck we're, we're, yeah. we're locked into that right? um, is that not a, if you don't have that in front of you that's I fine. don't have that in front of me but I could venture I could venture a guess but I don't want to do that but I let me just let me just put the the calculator to it because I, I know how to get, how to get there. You know, there's, there's fixed costs that we have to run a facility, and then there are fixed costs that we have to do in order to be an approved um, school system, uh, following the requirements of Ed 300. You know, we ed, ed, the educational uh, rules and regulations. You know, we have to offer PE. We have to offer this class. We have to offer so many sections. So, you know, this is something that it includes an instructional piece, too, that are fixed costs. Sure. Special ed, also, mandated by federal law. Absolutely. That, that is right. definitely a fixed right. cost. So that, that's kind of where I'm coming from, and that, that's a number I will get you. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah. But then, just, just to ask, so that's not including the amount spent on books or any of those other kinds of things where you could spend what we've been spending or more or less. Yeah, you're looking yeah, for Yeah, that's the, the number I'm looking for, right. Uh, uh, Non-discretionary spending. Right. I, I think that's a good number to share with the general public because I, I think that people can look at this number and say, wow, $77 million is a lot of money. But many, much of that money has already been kind of discussed and agreed to in, in previous years, and, and I, I think often people forget that. We've agreed to contracts for uh, support staff. I, I think this year the teachers are up for negotiation, but the support staff one has already been agreed to two years ago or three or something like that. So, um, you know, it's, it's not really up for debate right now. It, it, it's asked and answered, I guess, is my it's point. It's the so. first year of a three-year agreement. Okay. Thank mm -hmm. you. The reason, there's other things like that, is my point. So. The reason I spoke up is because there are things that may not be considered fixed that are essential. You know, mandated. if... Well, I don't want to mean mandated, but, you, you know, the fixed costs, I would think, are the, the, you know, to be accredited and to be able to open up the building. But if you don't consider some of the other stuff in the budget as fixed, 
um, you could say that that number could, could, could be deceptively lower than it actually is because if you don't count uh, supplies, for example, as a fixed cost, that you can't really do what you need to do to educate students, right? Well, supplies are part of the instructional day. You have to have those right. in order to pr provide instruction. What I'd probably be looking at, quite frankly, is, is, is some of the, uh, the maintenance items that you could defer, but I would list those out, and I would list the ramifications deferring, of deferring those maintenance items. You know, it's either you've got to do it one way or another, and it's coming at you, but is it a fixed cost right now? No. Is it... Is it discretionary? Perhaps. Uh, is it definitely needed? Yeah. We wouldn't have put it in the budget if it wasn't right. needed. So. And I'm agreeing with you. I know what you're getting at. I'm I know just what saying I, yeah. that I some, sometimes there's folks that don't know the whole story. And if, if you don't look at maintenance of equipment as a fixed cost, then it costs you, you know, half a million dollars to replace a, a unit on top of the cafeteria. So then it's an essential cost. Then it's a, it's a, uh, absolute yeah. necessary cost, but if you didn't look at the maintenance of that, we wouldn't have gotten 40 years out of it or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. I'm, I agree with you. I know what you were getting at. I'm just saying that I, I'm sometimes afraid of a number like that because there's folks in this community that could say, well, that's what we should be spending. Well, no, that's not true. Parking well, paving would be a great example yeah. of that. Deferring that would have cost much, much more money than it would have saved. Yeah, and we like to look at it like, you know, <coughs> our, our, our capital is in our people. And so 75% of our budget is uh, salaries and benefits yeah. for the people who work here, who provide the educational experience mm -hmm. for the kids per the DOE regulations and above the DOE regulations. I think we're a damn good school district, and uh, that's what we try and do every day is make, make everything, everybody succeed. So that would probably be in there too. But I, I can try and work something out. I got a question because we're kind of just spooling here. Um, when you interview a new, um, someone that you're going to hire in the for, for the district, wh where do you do that? The cafeteria at your building? I would say we do it in different places, so it, it just depends um, on what part of the facility we need to go to. But we use the high school a lot, the meeting room off the main office. So, so besides so, your, your office in the admin building, mm -hmm. there's not actually a, a room there no, that you could theoretically bring in a couple people to interview somebody or have a discussion the about only something? Room that, well, other than our, our respective offices, um, there's the kitchen that um, Matt referred to and um, if you haven't been in the greenhouse it really would be um, something for you to see just so you see what its layout is because it really was a home <coughs> and we've actually met people who lived in the home mm -hmm. and um, and so it was converted into an office and, and it has you know served us well over time but seriously we either go to the main office uh, conference room at the high school or we go to the document room um, in the White House where maintenance is, yeah. or we go over to the back room in the Blue House, um, which is where student services are. So it just depends on what um, room and what facility is available at the I'm time. gonna just say one thing on this. I, I'm thrilled that you've made it work and that you've, as people need to do in homes and jobs and life, I'm glad that you've made it work. I think it's uh, incredibly embarrassing. I think it's horrifying that we're one of the biggest cities in the state and um, we're at a point, you know, we've got a $77 million budget and you don't have a, you don't have a contemporary um, office or meeting room to be able to talk to potential employees, uh, parents, and, and, and folks like that. So, you know, I'm, I'm kind of going off of what Matt was saying that you know it's um, you've made it work but I um, and this isn't the place but um, but I, I look forward to the to uh, at some point in the near future where um, you can have a building where you're on the same floor you're not you're not 60 degrees in your office and you can have a place um, to bring in guests and admin other administrators and um, and parents and 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 folks and and not feel like you're you're crowded into the lunchroom. I think that's you know. 
thank you for saying that and I do think that the uh, planning and building committee and the school board are committed um, to providing a new SAU uh, student services building um, and combining um, those employees that work in the greenhouse and the blue house into one house and ultimately <coughs> I think the goal was uh, to take um, the area where uh, the red building is and convert that into a proper space and right. it would be proper if we were all on the first floor mm -hmm. um, because it's not handicapped accessible either for anyone who needs to talk about financial services or whatever um, or ADA compliant the downstairs employees need to come upstairs to see um, those persons so we do need to get to that um, it's just been that there have been other priorities before this and uh, where you called it embarrassment uh, Jordan I understand that completely but I will tell you that when somebody comes to be hired in Merrimack they understand what our top priority is right which is kids first yep and that's what it, it says and that's what people have said to us yeah or um, we also do a criminal record check and we do that downstairs that's where um, the area is for that and when persons come in they cannot believe um, how many employees we actually house downstairs and how we've utilized the space so we've had a lot of um, good conversations over the way we utilize space and uh, you you know I'm not criticizing I'm not no. I'm on yeah. your side I'm not yeah and I, I've, I've oh, I'm sorry hi um, first I, I do want to commend you guys on using a tiny house for 40 years um, that's amazing and I don't think that clean air and um, heat are grandiose ideas to wish for in your workspace um, but the one question I did have is um, just sort of it's my first year and I know that there's a lot of people in the community that tend to have opinions on the, uh, the large budget and the large amount that gets paid to things like health insurance and, and whatnot but um, how many jobs are created because of this school district Basically, how many people are employed by the school district? We, if you want to count substitutes, mm -hmm. and we have them come in, um, we just got finished running W-2s. There's around 1,400 W-2s that we ran. That means okay. that at some point in time, if you're a coach, mm -hmm. if you're a sub, if you're something, um, you know, we have like 750 yeah. full-time staff. But then when you look at all the subs and everything like that coming in part-time hither and yon throughout the year, it's around 1,400, 1400 people. So you know? it's pretty fair to say that we're a good employer. It, it, you know, the school district here is yeah. a good employer. I would, but one um, of the larger I would ones. mark that by yeah. saying that we have many employees who um, have come and have spent their career here. Mm -hmm. So they've been committed to the Merrimack School District. Okay. Our turnover is is minimal thanks yeah and there's this one thing that Marge had mentioned when you have new hires all the new hires if you're a teacher if you're a sub if you're a volunteer they all have to be Paula our, our um, the person who you who greets you when she first when you first come in who's a wonderful person terrific personality she's like the perfect person for for that portion of her job she will take people and bring them down the stairs so you've got a stairway so already if you have somebody in a wheelchair it's kind of hard to fingerprint them we haven't had that happen but the fingerprint machine is in, in the in the back room so she'll bring them downstairs and a lot of times they'll have little kids with them and so when they come around the corner they see me sitting in my office and I get the, the funniest reactions you know like I, I always get this mommy there's a man in that room and I go hi how you doing you know and then she they go around the corner and they say there's a lady under the staircase and you know we all we all laugh about it and it is what it is and it's a good thing the woman under the staircase is only five feet tall which is great we had a height requirement for her job description so she could fit there perfectly but it's just you know it, we we just we have a good time because of the quality of the people in there and the people that we work with and the building it's got its shortcomings we would like something better that was functional but you know something we do our jobs regardless of where we are I'll set Gillian Mackenzie do you have anything 
I do not. Carol? No, I'm all set. I would just like to say, yeah, you guys do a fantastic job with what you have. And I could just imagine what it would be like if you had a little more and it was better. And I'm glad to see that this committee is asking questions about these antiquated, dilapidated buildings. I think that will help in the future a lot. Um, yeah, $77 million is a lot of money. But it takes a lot of money to run a school district with thousands of kids, hundreds of employees, thousands of people coming in and out of the building all the time. And you got to keep them looking nice and in good condition. You don't want them falling apart like some school districts. And we're very fortunate that we keep our equipment in top-notch shape. Kids that come to schools from other areas when they're playing here for sports or visiting or whatever, a lot of them you can hear them comment about how nice this place looks compared to where they're going to school. And that says a lot for our school community. And people can complain about the school district budget, but it is what it is. You've got to educate the kids. And we don't have the luxury of being a city where the city is picking up half of the tab for the buildings and the bonding and everything else. We have to all fund it separately. And we're independent, so we can do what we want which is good. Anybody else have any other questions for administration? Boy, you guys got off real easy tonight. I would like to thank you very much. Um, this concludes our budget presentations of all the departments. Um, before we go to public participation, uh, well, actually, you know what? I'll just kind of go to public participation. Is there anybody out in the public that would like to speak? Seeing none, I don't see any blue seats moving. I will close public participation and go to other. Our next meeting is Tuesday, February 5th at 7 o'clock here in the cafeteria where we will be discussing Warren articles these will be Warren articles primarily uh, crafted by the School Board of the Administration. We will also have a work session on the budget to make any adjustments to the operating budget that we might see fit or not see fit. Um, I will point out that there is supposed to be a petitioned Warren article coming in regarding a turf field for behind the high school. Uh, it is unknown to me whether it is definitely going to be a bond or if it's going to be tried to be paid for all at one time. Uh, if it is a bond, it needs to be into the school district by the 8th of February. If it's not in by the 8th of February, it cannot go forward as a bond and it cannot be changed into a bond at deliberative session. Uh, if it's going to be paid for all at once, they have until the 12th of February to turn the Warren article in before our meeting. Um, if the Warren article is in next week, we will discuss that potential petitioned warrant article. If it's not, we will wait until the 12th when we have our meeting beforehand. Um, if you are planning on making adjustments to the budget, please have your information and the dollar amount you're looking to adjust. Uh, while we can zero out a line item, 
Um, it's still, the school board could say, well, I'm going to take the money from another department and pay for that even though we decided we didn't want it. But we do give some guidance and direction. And it's the budget committee's operating budget. It's our budget number that we settle on that goes to the voters at deliberative session. And then the voters at deliberative session get the opportunity to amend it and then go for the general election in April. Uh, as far as the Warren articles go, we vote on the money Warren articles only, and we cannot change the amounts, change the wording. We either vote to recommend or not recommend. Um, Hopefully, we'll have a fairly reasonable quick evening. Should we get snowed out, our snow date for that meeting is on Thursday, February 7th. And just to go on a little farther, the final work session on the budget, uh, last minute adjustments, and the public hearing on the budget is Tuesday, February 12th. It starts at 7 o'clock as a meeting here. We recess the meeting at 7.30, open the public hearing at 7.30. And that's when, hopefully, we fill a room with residents who want to come and talk about the budget and give us their ideas. After the residents are done speaking, presentations have been made for different warrant articles. We close the public hearing, go back into session, and take our final vote on the budget. Is everybody clear on that? Does anybody have any questions about that? Hey, Stan. Yes, Carol. Um, just for public information, can either you or Matt remind people of what the tax impact is per thousand dollars of added or deleted money? Uh, it's running about three cents on the dollar for every hundred thousand dollars. Okay. So, um, and, and not meaning to talk about it in advance, but if if we were to finance that whole turf field at one point two million dollars, which is the, what I understand the figure that's been bantered around, uh, that's going to be about thirty six cents on the tax rate. So if you figure out the value of your home and add it up and do the math, you can figure out how much that will cost you to pay for it in one year versus bonding it. Uh, at this time, I am going to uh, say good night to Carol and to Mackenzie because I don't want to do a roll call vote to adjourn. And I hope you okay. understand that. You all set, Mackenzie? Yes, I'm good. Do you have any final words you want to say to the committee and the general public? I do not. Okay, Carol? I'm all set. Have a good night. Stay warm. Yes, we will. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Anything else to come before the Budget Committee this evening? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Made by Jordan. Do I have a second? Seconded by Amanda. All those in favor? It's non-debatable. Aye. All those opposed? We are adjourned. Thank you all. Good night. We'll see you February 5th.
surface. Um, there's a cover in case it's snowing when or raining when we're getting the materials out of, this, out of the drop. You know, um, there's a location that's already been selected on the library property for where the drop is going to go. We had, you were maybe not on the board at the time, but there were many, many, many steps um, to clear the location. It's where the, the can shed used to right. be. It's right on the